Hi, I'm Dylan Cox and welcome to this fifth episode of the Seconds Out Boxing Weekly Wrap-Up. Lots of things to discuss today. We've got the fights from the weekend that just happened and also we can look forward to some of the big fights in the coming season, both here domestically and in the rest of the world. So where to start? We'll start with Kubrat Pulev beating Tony Thompson over in Germany on a triple header card featuring Jürgen Bremer and Artur Abraham, the former super middleweight world champion and middleweight world champion. Bremer, a guy that was supposed to fight cleverly a few years ago, and Abraham, a guy who, through the process of the Super Six, took a few losses and is trying to rebuild his career following a loss to Stieglitz recently. Both those guys faced guys that maybe not a lot of people had heard of, and they were sort of gimme wins in a sense, but hopefully they get some back on the, on the radar for world championship fights, and we'll probably be seeing more of them as this season progresses. But Pulev versus Thompson was the headline event, and it was good to see Tony Thompson back in action so soon after his most recent win over David Price. Let's not forget, Thompson had come over to the UK twice and twice knocked out David Price, one of our British heavyweight hopes. And he did the fight, and the second fight he did it by coming off the floor, so a lot of kudos for Thompson for doing that, and then going straight into a difficult fight against an unbeaten fighter that not a lot of guys want to fight in Kubrat Pulev for an eliminator for the IBF heavyweight title held by none other than Vladimir Klitschko. Let's not forget, Thompson's already had two cracks at Klitschko. The first time he did a lot better, the second time he was stopped sooner in the fight. I think it was round six, and Thompson fighting Vladimir a third time is not something a lot of people want to see, but fair play for Thompson for pushing to try and get another world, world title opportunity. You can't deny a man that opportunity. So against Pulev, who's facing a guy who's been in with some good guys, just beat Ustinov in his last fight, an unbeaten heavyweight. He beat in the likes of Dominic Gwynn, Michael Sprott, um, Dimitrenko, European champion at, at one point. Dimitrenko, incidentally, sparring with David Hay at the moment for his preparation for Tyson Fury. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but let's focus on Pulev. What happened in that fight early against Thompson was Thompson was getting the upper hand. He'd obviously come to win, which we saw in the second prize fight. Didn't seem so much in the first prize fight that Thompson had come to win, but he did win. For the second prize fight, he was in good shape. He looked ready and willing in this fight against Pulev. Pulev didn't set the world on fire, I'm not going to lie. He didn't look fantastic, but what we did see was a workmanlike win from Pulev and he beat a decent guy and you know even though he's 41 years old he's still a contender as he proved by beating Price so a good win for Pulev and now he gets himself a shot at Vladimir Klitschko providing Klitschko can come through um, Povetkin in October. That fight's happening in Russia you know this the big purse bid for 25 million for that fight is all a bit strange but it's going to be happening and interesting to see if Povetkin can can kick on and, and give Vladimir some problems. It, I, read, I read something recently, and we all know Povetkin was training with Teddy Atlas, and Teddy Atlas let Povetkin go because he said, I don't think you're going to be able to beat the Klitschkos and you might as well just check it in. Bit extreme, but we know Teddy can be a little bit like that. When I went to the Olympics last year, he, uh, he was working at NBC and he, he definitely ruffled a few feathers in Aiba, so he's not one to hold back from his opinions, Teddy Atlas, and you've got to respect him for that. So we had that, that big fight over in Germany, that big fight card, two snoozers really and you know, well the, the Pulev fight was a bit of a snoozer as well but he's got himself into that mandatory position that sort of shapes the heavyweight division slightly. A couple of weeks back um, Deontay Wilder blew out Sergei um, Lyakovich, I can't remember how to pronounce it right now, sorry, um, Lyakovich and the White Wolf and he just blasted him out in one round basically, some very crisp punching and I like Deontay Wilder, I think he's a very skilled guy, he's working with Mark Braylon who many of you will know had a very very extensive and I think unbeaten amateur career, or pretty much unbeaten, I think he lost one or something, Olympic gold medalist, went on to win a world title, probably didn't fulfil his potential in the pros Braylon but he's showing some signs of a good trainer, I've seen him do some pads in um, in the corner with, with Wilder and I do start to think to myself okay you know it doesn't always work that an ex-world champion is a good trainer but it looks like with Braylon, he's doing a good job with Wilder. So Wilder comes off that first round knockout, 29-0 now. He's gone over to spar David Hay this week, we hear, and David Hay's obviously taking this Fury fight seriously. But you look at Wilder, and then you look at someone like Pulev, and Pulev is the typical Eastern European, quite a technical boxer, not particularly fast, not particularly hard-hitting. He doesn't seem to be great at one thing, but an all-round, you know, decent fighter, whereas Wilder's a bit more exciting, a bit more, you know, for better, want of a better word, wild. And it would be good to see if that fight could potentially happen, should the Klitschko fight not happen, etc. Because I think Wilder's now ready for that next big step up. I don't think Harrison or um, Lyakovich is a big step up for him. I think someone like um, Pulev would be would be a good, good fight. Someone also mentioned in the comments that a Chisora fight would be good, or even a Malik Scott fight before Malik 
had lost to Chisora. So I tend to agree with that. I think he needs to be stepping up to the next level and we'll see um, what he can gain from the sparring with, with Hay. He's already sparred the likes of Klitschko. He was one of Klitschko's chief sparring partners for a while, one of his previous camps. So he's getting that experience well done. It'd be good to see what happens with him. And I think a lot of us uh, are quite excited about, about Deontay Wilder. So one fight that may have gone under the radar was Vlasislav Senchenko, Kel Brook's future opponent, had a four-round stoppage over a guy called Carlos Adam Jerez, an Argentinian fighter who'd been in with the likes of former Kel Brook opponent Saldivia and had lost to him, been in with Anthony Mundine and lost to him, and Senchenko managed to, to get a four-round stoppage. I don't know how much you can take from that, obviously, because it was just a, a tune-up fight, but interesting that he's taken a fight in between um, the Kel Brook fight, and I think that just gets him fight ready, and he'll be you know, straight back into camp and preparing for it. So it, sees, it shows that he's taking the fight seriously. It was in the Ukraine, so his home country, etc. But I think it'll be interesting to see how he performs on the night. So a lot of people are saying this is Kel's toughest test. I, I, I have to agree with that, perhaps, because I don't think Kel's had too many tough tests, but I still don't think he's the big step up that his promoter Eddie Hand's making him out to be. Great fight itself for the fans with the whole Ricky Hatton angle. We just mentioned Anthony Mundine there and rumour has it that he has agreed to fight Shane Mosley in Australia at 154. Mosley uh, maybe a little bit passing out and it's sad to see him keep fighting and one has to wonder why he continues to fight because he's obviously fought the biggest names of his generation right from the De La Hoyas to the Pacquiao's, Mayweather's, Cotto's, you know you name him, Vernon Forrest, he, you know, Right back, he beat an Australian for his first world title, didn't he? Philip Holiday, I think, is that right? I don't, I'm not 100% I'm not sure on that. But he, yeah, he's fought the biggest names of his era. He must have banked a hell of a lot of money. And to, to go back and fight, continue to fight, I know he's a fighter, but I don't really want to see it. I think he's he's past his best now, obviously. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crude marketing tool by Mundine and his people because that will sell a lot of tickets in Australia. They've got some very fanatical fans out there that will buy into these big fights. So interesting that that's going to be happening. Some domestic news here, obviously after Great Vine, saw this on boxing scenes, saw this on Ring TV as well. Richard Schaefer, and there's a video out there on Ellie Sackback's channel as well. Richard Schaefer talking to the press at a press conference in the States. I think it was the Mares uh, Gonzalez press conference, which I'm going to be talking about in a second, that fight. And Schaefer just basically said he wanted to get a fight between Peter Quill and Kid Chocolate, WBA champion, against uh, Ricky Hatton's fighters because he's got a lot of respect for Ricky. They worked very closely, obviously, through some of Ricky's biggest fights. He was with uh, Golden Boy for the Mayweather fight, for the Pacquiao fight, etc. So I think he he wanted to do Ricky a favour and say, OK, you've got, you've got one of the best middleweights in the world. He showed that against um, Sergio Martinez, Martin Murray, that is. And we'll come to England, we'll bring Peter Quillen over there and we'll make that fight in the UK for a world title. Martin's got visa issues, he can't travel to the States for whatever reason. Let's make it happen. But for some reason, Ricky Hatton, CEO of his promotional company and you know whatever role you want to give it, a guy called Richard Poxon, who a lot of people will know from the Clinton Woods days, the Fight Academy days, etc. He's done a bit of training and he, he worked his way into becoming the head of boxing for Hatton Promotions has somehow messed this up. Now that's according to Richard Schaefer, there's no comments from Poxon to counter that. So we don't know how much truth is in that and if Richard Schaefer's just throwing his weight around a little bit in his double-breasted suit. But we have to question, you know, what has what has happened there because surely it makes sense for Martin Murray, you can get a world champion in your backyard. It's like a dream come true. And why isn't your promoter taking that fight? And I don't think Golden Boy would have tried to, you know, be too hard on the financial side of things because they would have made a big card out of it. They could have chucked some of the, their British guys, Anthony Gogo, Haroon Khan, they could have made a bit of a card out of it. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't struggle and they could have got TV because they could have been on Box Nation. They've done that before uh, with the Deontay Wilder fight. They could have been on Sky even maybe, could have show, show shared with, with Eddie Hearn or something. So it, it does raise a few questions and it'd be interesting to know what happens with that. So Murray Quillen isn't going to be happening unfortunately. Another bit of world news is that the Japanese Olympic gold medalist at middleweight, Ryota Murata, has turned pro and he signed with Top Rank and also Tekken Promotions in Japan. It's like a joint deal. Obviously, Japan's a new market for Top Rank. They haven't really explored that before. We've seen them going into China, Macau, with Manny Pacquiao and, and Zhu Shiming. And that's a, a new step into a massive potential pay-per-view market there in China. But they're also looking around the globe for other stars. Now, if you saw Ryota Murata box at the Olympics, you could see that his style was very much suited to the pros. He's, he's, he's a very strong guy, physically very strong, but he's also 
very, um, he's got high output of punches. He didn't have that typical amateur style with like a, almost like a high guard with a very just sort of point scoring fencing style. He liked to work inside. And the final against the, the Brazilian fighter was fantastic. And I think Murata showed that he's got the heart and the, and the passion to do it. Interestingly, after the games, um, Murata, who was lecturing at a university um, near Tokyo, I believe, said that he didn't want to turn professional. He'd won Olympic gold and he was happy to go back to his lecturing, etc. But it turns out he decided to turn pro. I'm sure it was a very lucrative deal with top rank. He came over to him. Well, he went over to America for the press conference. He did. He did his. Uh, he did his press obligations there. I think Radio Rahim's got some videos up on Seconds Out channel with Murata and his his translator. And he made his debut at the weekend. It was against um, the OPBF or OBPF champion, which is the equivalent of a British guy going in with like an area title. Uh, level opponent for their first fight. So it was a good step into the pro game. The guy had about 30 fights. And I think Murata is one to watch out for, you know, and keep an eye on him because you don't get many Japanese fighters of his size. And he, as we've seen with the smaller weight Japanese fighters, they're very technically adept and they've got great engines and they make for some great fights. So let's talk about Hay versus Fu. That's coming up in September and I've just touched on some of the sparring. So I just wanted to, to just discuss that a little bit. So we've got news that that uh, Deontay Wilder is going to spare with David Hayes. He's, he's also been sparring Dimitrenko and Richard Towers. I believe he's got some other guys coming in as well. So he's got the sort of height of Richard Towers and this kind of aggressiveness there. He's got the, the height and the sort of skills of Dimitrenko but he's, and slightly more robotic than Dimitrenko, but he's also brought in a guy who is a fearsome puncher in Deontay Wilder, and that's what I'm most interested in. I'd love to see those sparring sessions, see how sharp Hay is, and how Wilder can do against a, a smaller, quicker opponent, because I rate Wilder, and I'm not sure how effective Hay has been at heavyweight, but I'd love to see how, how these guys these guys mix it up in the gym, as I'm sure would most fans. On the Fury camp over in Belgium, he's had a, a steady stream of, of, of sparring partners going through. Michael Sprott's been out there. Sprott, obviously, uh, a decent European level fighter himself, but has spent a lot of time in the Klitsch Coast camp. I don't know if Spot's a very good sparring partner to imitate David Hay because he's not as quick. He's obviously very durable and he's, he's a good boxer, Sprott, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. But what did make a lot of sense, and I was thinking of this when they first made the fight, was Steve Cunningham, the guy that Tyson just beat and had a bit of a struggle with over in the States, has come over to Belgium and started sparring him. And I think he's the best preparation you can get for David Hay because. David Hayes is a bit of an anomaly in the sense that he's you know, very quick, very athletic, very good punch, and they don't have many of those at heavyweight or at cruiserweight for, any, for that matter at the moment. So Cunningham, who looked very sharp in that fight against Fury, is probably a good choice by Team Fury. And that fight really hasn't caught a light in the broader sense yet. It's not like Froch Kesto is like drummed into you on Sky and stuff. Because we've had the summer break, etc., it's kind of just leveled out a bit, but I'm sure come the 1st of September, that fight will be straight back in the papers. The, the, the hyperbole and the, the, the chat and the, the Sky Sports machine behind it, I'm sure that will rise right back up to the surface and we'll see a lot, a lot of that fight in the press, only to be outdone by, on the world stage, Canelo versus Mayweather. We have done a split seconds out special relating to that and we hope to have that out with you very soon. Uh, myself and Editor-in-Chief Clive Benef I've been talking about that fight and again about the Fury Hay fight and we'll be posting that on the channel hopefully in the next couple of weeks so stay tuned for that. So that's pretty much it for this week's video blog. I am going to end it on a high though and talk about the Mares versus Gonzalez fight. Abner Mares was touted by Golden Boy as the next big superstar in the featherweight division. He beat him Ponce de Leon for the WBC title and he was going in against the former world champion Johnny Gonzalez, someone who we knew that could bang but we didn't expect the result there. So Bernard Hopkins had, had tweeted uh, something like, they don't teach the young guys how to defend these days. And these guys were going out. And it was a wide uh, left hook that dropped Maris originally. And then the follow-up barrage, it was like a left hook, a right hand, a jab, and then a right hand, and Maris was out. But if you haven't seen it yet, check the post-fight interview and the post-fight press conference on seconds out at the radio Rahim field when he was out there. Maris takes defeat very well. Where does Maris go from here? Well, I'm sure he wasn't too badly damaged after that fight. He seemed fairly coherent afterwards and, you know, down. But I think once you've stripped away the loss on a, on a fighter's record, it can help them to go forward. But in a knockout situation, you just don't know how much that has taken out of them. So we'll see who Golden Boy match Maris with next and when he's next back in action. And for Gonzalo as well, you know, there's some big fights out there. Some people were saying that Maris was ready for the likes of Rigondo and... 
Rigano, sorry, and uh, Donaire, and I just don't think he's he was at that level. But as the hype machine gets going, you start to think, well, maybe he is, maybe he is. But then a fight like this can show that, well, first thing, anybody's capable of being beaten, and secondly, that maybe you have to uh, limit your expectations on a young fighter until they've had those real big gut checks. So marriage will come again, I'm sure, but for Johnny Gonzalez, what a great result for him. Well, thank you very much for watching this week's video blog with me, Dylan Cox. I'll be back next week, same sort of time, but don't forget I'll be having a Sunday wrap-up on Sunday and keep an eye out for those Seconds Out September specials that should be on the channel very soon. Any questions or comments, please do put them underneath the video. Tweet me at Dylan Cox Boxing and don't forget to subscribe, youtube.com Seconds Out for all the latest videos and like and share. And I'll see you very soon.